Welcome, everybody. It's Tuesday, October 28th, 2014. And we're talking antitrust and monopoly today with Tom DiLorenzo, professor of economics at the former Loyola College, now Loyola University, in Baltimore. Tom is also the author of about a dozen books, including The Real Lincoln, Hamilton's Curse, and How Capitalism Saved America. It's my pleasure to welcome Tom back to the show. Tom DiLorenzo, thanks for being here. Glad to be back with you, Tom. I wanted to talk about antitrust because I went back and looked over the 270-something episodes I've done and realized I hadn't covered this. So who better to talk to than Tom DiLorenzo? Now, by the way, Dom Armentano, who is really our full-time antitrust scholar, has grown just so discouraged by the seeming inability to crack through the prejudices surrounding antitrust, that he devotes his whole career to it, he overturns every single myth associated with it, and then he sees the old orthodoxies creeping back in again. He just doesn't do interviews. He, I asked him months ago, and he just wouldn't do it. He was friendly, but he just wouldn't do it. Whereas you and I just keep on fighting. Like, we don't care. right? We just keep on going. Now, what's the basic reason that people think we have antitrust law? Well, the basic basic reason is uh, uh, they believe in the idea of we're from the government and we were here to save you, uh, that is, to save you from rapacious monopolies. That's always been the story, that if you allow the free market to operate. And I think part of this is uh, comes from Karl Marx himself. You know, Marx was uh, among the other crazy ideas he had was that the merger after merger after merger would lead to just one giant corporation running the whole world. And there was never anything even that crazy in a James Bond mo- uh, a novel, but that was Marx's theory. And I've even had over the years, I've had sort of serious uh, scholars like the editors of an antitrust review ask me uh, in all seriousness what I thought of Marx's th- theory in the uh, and, I, and, of course, I told them, but I think that's still in the minds of the, a lot of the average people out there. They're worried about this boogeyman of sort of a James Bondish uh, takeover of the world by one giant corporation, and along with a gross economic ignorance also. So it's easy to fool people if they've never even studied economics for five minutes. Well, one uh, contribution that Rothbard made, of course, was to point out that the same problems that would beset a socialist planning board would be set one single firm. It would have no external right. markets. It wouldn't be able to calculate. But we're not dealing, I think, with cool economic analysis when it comes to fears of one big firm. I think this is a this is emotionalism and sensationalism and hysteria. All right. So you've done a lot of work on the 19th century, in particular, and accusations of industries as being monopolized and so on and so forth. And you found some rather interesting results when you actually bothered to examine the data that was available. Well, yeah, earlier in my academic career, you know, I had, uh, I had done a lot of research and writing on the uh, area of antitrust, and uh, all the textbooks, even, even all, not just, you know, the beliefs of the common man out there, but all the textbooks said that there once was a golden age of antitrust where there was rampant monopolization of the U.S. economy in the late 19th century, and government came to the rescue, you know, riding in on a white horse that saved America from monopoly. And then the same books will say, however, for the uh, subsequent 100 years or so, it didn't work out that way. More often than not, it did just what Dominic Armentano says in his book, his great book, Antitrust and Monopoly. Uh, the government goes out there and sues companies for cutting prices, improving products, creating new products, and generally doing great things for consumers. And it always sounded uh, awfully fishy to me that uh, a regulatory regime that would be harmful to consumers for a hundred years uh, had one little golden era of maybe five years where it was needed. <laughs> and so I looked into it, the origins of antitrust, and lo and behold, I found that no economist uh, as of the 1980s when I started doing this work had ever asked, actually asked the question, well, what was happening in the late 19th century? Was there really a monopoly? And, uh, and these are the same economists that also will tell you, well, there was uh, price deflation for the whole post-Civil War era until the turn of the 20th century. 
And so, you know, price deflation, declining prices, should at least be a red flag that uh, there wasn't, you know, maybe there wasn't monopolization if prices are going down, you know, according to the standard view. So I looked into it and I dug up, uh, I was the first one to dig up the actual statistics on all the industries that were accused of being monopolies at that time. And I found that for 10 years prior to the passage of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, these were the most vigorously uh, price-cutting and production-expanding companies in America. They were the most innovative, the most entrepreneurial, and for uh, for an entire decade, they they, uh, they cut prices faster than the price level, that is, the consumer price index had been going down, and they'd been expanding output faster than uh, the economy as a whole, than GDP was. And so uh, even according to the, the standard uh, mainstream economic criteria, of monopoly, which is uh, supply restriction and price escalation, these companies were all doing the opposite, the exact opposite. And that's why they were targeted, by the way, by the government. Their sour grapes competitors did not want to compete. They wanted to stop, they wanted to get the government to stop them from competing. And so I concluded that antitrust always was a protectionist racket designed to uh, protect consumers from low prices. This work of yours originally appeared in the International Review of Law and Economics, but now people who might not have access to that can read this data in your book, How Capitalism Saved America, if I'm remembering that book correctly. Yes, I have it in uh, How Capitalism Saved America. There's a chapter on the myth of antitrust, and you can read it, and you can you, know, you can look up the footnotes if you want also and find my original uh, academic journal article on it. And, uh, and that's where to find it. And it's also some, I've also written it up on the BCs.org uh, in a few different places. I'll, I'll want to get in a minute to the different views of competition that the Austrian school has versus those who support uh, antitrust. But first, just to, again, to, before we get into anything theoretical, I want to ground people in empirical examples. Over the course of the 20th century, presumably we've we can recall firms that seemed at the time to be absolutely invincible. That There was no way you were ever going to see them be displaced by anybody else. And yet, as usual, they were displaced. Are there any that come to your mind? Uh, well, yeah, well, IBM. Uh, you know, the, the government started suing IBM in the 1960s for uh, violating the antitrust laws, supposedly. And, and so they were in, in the, involved in litigation for a long time. Uh, until uh, uh, finally, uh, in the early 80s, the judge in the case died, and so the government just gave up. But in the meantime, IBM had been totally eclipsed by Microsoft and, all, and lots of other uh, new computer companies because IBM had the, the bad idea that people would not be interested in personal computers. Their business was selling these big mainframe computers to universities and corporations and things like that. And they were behind the behind the uh, the wave uh, on that, and so and I, I can remember reading articles of uh, IBM losing four hundred million dollars a day for quite a while during that during that period, and that's the whole history of uh, of uh, manufacturing in the United States. There, there's an economist, uh, the late Yale Brosen, who wrote a book called Concentration Mergers and Public Policy. It's a, it's a survey of uh, uh, some pretty good economic research on this whole issue of antitrust, and one of the one of the points that he really makes and, and hits, hits a home run on is that if you look over time, if you look at statistics on market share and dominance of a of a, a company or a number, even a number of companies over, over time, then yeah, at any one point in time, someone's at the top. Just like at any one year, someone's going to win the Super Bowl. Uh, but if you look five years hence and ten years hence, then what happens tends to happen is that that company descends toward the median, and then other companies that are down at the bottom uh, go up toward toward the median. And so there's al there's always been a lot of volatility in American industry, especially uh, with uh, increased globalization, as as it's called, which of course has been going on for hundreds of years. But uh, it's another word for international competition. And, uh, and so I, rec I recommend that book as a companion book to Dom Armentano's Antitrust and Monopoly, if anybody's interested in this particular area. I think among the general public, there's a connection between support for antitrust and fear of predatory pricing. Even if they don't know that term, 
they know the basic idea that you have a firm that's really dominant and it sells products below cost to drive all its competitors out, and then it reaps monopoly profits afterward. And that sounds plausible when you first hear it, but turns out it's not really that plausible. And I would just point out in parentheses, not that Amazon is trying to do this, but Amazon is really the place that so many of us just instinctively go to buy things, and they do have very low prices, and yet the, even they, even, assuming that they are aiming at predatory pricing, which I don't think they are, but even assuming they are, they, say, they can't seem to make it work. They just lost $437 million in the last quarter alone. So yeah. a Amazon shareholders are subsidizing my purchases is what's basically happening there. But what are the flaws, uh, at, least, at least some of them, in the idea of predatory pricing? Why should we not actually be afraid of this? Uh, well, first of all, if anybody's interested, uh, go ahead and Google the myth of, any, of predatory pricing and my name, and you'll find an old article I wrote about it that lays all this out. But uh, the, the story is, uh, you know, one contradiction of this theory is that it starts by saying a company has a war chest of profits and, it, and so that it loses money on purpose by charging a price below cost for, for many years, probably. And so, but, but where does this war chest come from? You know, I mean, the idea is uh, the monopoly creates the war chest, but uh, the economists who believe in these theories and others just assume the war chest exists. It's like magic. And so that's, that's one contradiction in the theory. And then another uh, part of it is, uh, you know, the competitors aren't just going to sit back and take it. If, if a company really was doing this, so, but, so pricing under cost uh, to try to drive everyone from the market, they could just shut down temporarily and let that company lose money like a bunch of fools like Amazon may well be doing right now. I don't, I don't know. And then, uh, when, and then the idea is, uh, you know, once everyone's driven from the market, you, you charge the sky's the limit, you charge a high price. So there's nothing from keeping other companies from entering at that point. And then so you would never be able to charge that high price to recoup the, the losses. Uh, I used to teach MBA classes, and, uh, and I had a lot of engineers in a, in a Loyola University in Baltimore. I had uh, Black & Decker engineers and people of that sort. Uh, and, uh, and I would ask them, well, what if you went back to work on Monday and you said, well, this is what I learned in the MBA class that, that you, my employer, are paying big bucks for for me to attend on Saturday. Here's what we should do at Black & Decker. We have this drill that costs uh, $10 to manufacture. We're going to start selling it for a dollar, and we're going to sell them. It might take five years, ten years, but we're going to drive everyone in the world out of the drill business, and then we're going to charge $500 for this drill. And I had these, these two engineers that sat in the front row just laughed and said, I'd probably be fired on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But that is, that is the theory of predatory pricing. But, but, but before that class, these guys probably, like most people who never really thought about it, they probably thought there was some, something to it. Well, and of course, the big business that supposedly is the one threatening us with this predatory pricing strategy by definition, has a substantial share of the market. That's why it's able to engage in it. And so that means that if it's taking losses on the products that it's selling, it's taking losses in proportion to its market share. So it's taking huge amounts of losses as compared right. to everybody else. Like, I mean, from on every level, it's, it's nonsensical. Yeah, right. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, another assumption of it is that the biggest firm, is the dominant firm, is the one who's going to practice this. But, of course, like you said, they're also the biggest loser. I like the name of that television show. If, they're the big, if they have the biggest market share, that means they're losing money on more shares, more sales than anybody else in the, in the market. And, you know, the, the classic article on this was by an economist named John McGee in the Journal of Law and Economics way back in the 1950s. And uh, because where the myth really got started was uh, John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company. And uh, he was accused by journalists of uh, predatory pricing. And uh, one of the memorable lines in John McGee's article was that after he talked about such things as you and I have just talked about, he said that uh, it would have been very foolish for Rockefeller to even attempt to monopolize the oil market through predatory pricing. And no matter what anybody has said about Rockefeller, no one ever accused him of being a fool when it came to business. And he, he would not have thrown money away. And and uh, John McGee uh, examined the whole court record of the antitrust suit against Standard Oil 
in the, and concluded there was no evidence of predatory pricing and and it would have been extraordinarily foolish for Rockefeller to even done such a thing. And besides that, when the government broke up his company in the year 1911, he still had uh, several hundred competitors in the oil market. So there was never anything remotely like a monopoly in those in those days in that market. And even big companies like Sunoco, Sun Oil Company, still existed and were competing against him at the time. Well, likewise, Professor Armentano, when he went through and looked at all those court cases pertaining to antitrust, came back and said, I can't find in all these cases over all these years a successful example of this. But, That's right. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, though, we get people on a popular level who will come back at you when you say things like this and give examples of what they think uh, are cases of predatory pricing. And all these examples they give are of big firms lowering prices. And then that's right. it. Well, where's the – yeah, but that's that's not predatory. Predatory pricing means once you do that, you then jack the prices up after. When I don't see Amazon doing that. I don't see Walmart doing that. I don't see any of these firms jacking the prices back up. No, that's uh, it's just competition, price-cutting competition. So, you know, people just shut up and enjoy the low prices. <laughs> you know, <laughs> why are they whining about low prices? Uh, uh, you know, what, one of the memorable things about Dom Armentano's book, antitrust and monopoly that he points out, which is absolutely true, that the way the antitrust law has been set up, if you cut your price, you might be accused by the government of predatory pricing. And there are all kinds of, there are hundreds of lawsuits about that. If you raise your price, you could be accused of being a monopoly. If you keep your price the same, you could be accused of conspiring and price fixing with your competitors. So no matter what you do with price, cut it, increase it, keep it the same, the government uh, have, uh, allows itself the latitude to sue you uh, for some reason. And, of course, a lot of this, all of this, I would argue all of this is politically motivated by the, by where politicians basically go on fishing expeditions for campaign contributions. Some company is doing really well. They're cutting their price uh, and, and expanding their product line, and people are happy with them. But they're taking market share away from the company in the district with the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. And so that company will go to the chairman and say, we've got to do something about this. They're taking their costing jobs out here in Dubuque, Iowa, or wherever, where he's from. And, and that's usually how these investigations get started, that uh, some sour grapes competitor bribes their member of Congress or their senator. That's how the investigation of Microsoft 15 years ago or whenever if so, if so got started. Its chief competitor at the time was Novell from Utah, and so they got Senator uh, Hatch from Utah to convene a special committee and a special investigation of Microsoft. And, of course, they didn't find anything. They investigated them for eight years. And then they finally litigated uh, and sued Microsoft. And all the government ever accused Microsoft of was spending too much money on research. The, the, the bottom line of their case was that they could not find any consumer harm However, they said Microsoft spent so much money on R&D, on research and development, that, that that was probably deterring their competitors from spending a lot on research and development because they were so successful with it, so that in the future, there will be consumer harm. That's what, that's what uh, Microsoft was accused of. That's like saying, you know, Tom Woods, I, I noticed you walked past that bank with a smile on your face, and I think maybe you're thinking of robbing that bank sometime in the future, <laughs> so we're going to prosecute you. And that's basically what the Microsoft case was about. Now, you mentioned earlier this idea that there was, at one time at least, a golden age of antitrust where we needed it and it really worked. Well, it, doesn't the Chicago School of Economics kind of feel like there could be a renaissance of this someday, that there's nothing inherently wrong with antitrust law. I mean, maybe there's some problems with the way it's implemented or it's unclear here and there, but the Chicago people, although they are free market by and large, don't reject antitrust outright. What do they see in it that's of value? Well, the old Chicago school, uh, you know, the late George Stigler had, had written on, the uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning economist had written on this, and uh, the big difference between them and the Austrian school is that the Chicago school still uh, has this model of competition that it believes in called perfect competition. That uh, It's a, a total sort of a fabrication of some ideal utopian world where there are many firms, they all produce the same thing, they charge the same prices, 
there's costless entry and exit, and it's sort of the uh, the, the uh, theoretical benchmark for competition. And the many firms assumption is the linchpin. You know, they, they redefine competition not to just mean rivalry and price cutting and innovation like the Austrians always have, but many firms. And so uh, uh, George Stigler once said in an article he wrote in, in a scholarly journal that uh, competition requires a Sherman Antitrust Act. And so, uh, and so that's their view that, uh, yeah, they might have screwed up for 120 years in enforcing this, but if you just put a bunch of smart guys trained at the University of Chicago in charge of it, we'll fix it. And, uh, but the, uh, the view of most Austrians, especially me, is that antitrust is inherently incompatible with a competitive economy because it, inter- it interferes with the natural evolution of competition. In, in various ways, and it's a political football. It's used as a political pork barrel by politicians. How could that possibly be uh, be good for competition? It's just a source, of, an additional source of rent seeking, uh, which I prefer to call plunder seeking through politics. Are there examples that occur to you off the top of your head of truly preposterous applications of antitrust law that may help people to see this more clearly? Uh, well, if, you know, Armin Tano's book, uh, for example, uh, he, he goes over case after case of uh, mergers, for example. I think when uh, when Brown Shoe and Kinney Shoe Company proposed merging, I think the merger would have resulted in something like a 2% market share by the new company, and the government sued them for attempting to monopolize the industry by by getting 2% of the, of the, of the uh, market, which is absurd. And so... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of times these mergers, you know, uh, one company will have uh, a good production and engineering staff and a mediocre <clears throat> sales and marketing, and the other company will have a mediocre sales and marketing, but a top-notch, uh, uh, you, know, you know, the other way around, and they'll create synergy. And that's what creates the benefits of mergers whenever they are beneficial, and they aren't always beneficial. Businessmen are not uh, omniscient. They don't always work out. But... Uh, but that's what was attempted with the, that that particular merger, and uh, and the government uh, you know stands in the way of it, tries to stop it. Even the, the sort of the persecution of Microsoft for all those years, the Bush administration uh, uh, examined them, investigated for four years, and then there was another four years of investigation. They handed it off from the antitrust division of the Justice Department to the Federal Trade Commission. So for eight years, they were investigated and accused of monopolizing. And then they were sued, and they had to spend many millions of dollars in legal fees and divert attention away from uh, making better computer products to uh, politics, basically. And in the end, nothing really happened. They they couldn't prove that that uh, any any consumer had ever been harmed by Microsoft's lower prices. And uh, and there's a good book, by the way, on this by uh, uh, two economists named uh, Steve Margolis and Stan Leibowitz. And uh, and they showed in one part of that book that almost everywhere where Microsoft, you know, in it 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, came up with a new type of software, financial software or whatever, uh, the effect was to to cause prices to plummet in that market because they entered as sort of the big dog that was uh, very competitive and and and, uh, and doing a great job in cost cutting and price cutting, and so they created a lot of enemies everywhere uh, they they could. Uh, they existed because of price cutting, not because of uh, monopoly. There were no consumers that were complaining about them at the time. It only, seems only competitors. It seems like Tom that whenever there's any serious merger being co- uh, contemplated between two firms, we always read in the paper that the Justice Department or some place is going to issue some kind of uh, decision as to whether or not the merger can go forward. So this is all because of antitrust law. Uh, yes, it is. That's part of the law that they, you know, before a corporate merger can happen, there's sort of a time period that they have to wait and let the government investigate, and uh, and, and then they issue their decree of whether or not they, it can go it can go forward. But you know, one of the things that does is, let's say, two companies decided that um, they would have a competitive advantage in their industry where there are currently 50 competitors if they were merged and have, you know, maybe one has a top-notch engineering group. And the other one has a top-notch marketing group. So if they combine the two, they can be more competitive and make more money. Well, that period of time will give the competitors 
uh, an opportunity to get together and figure out if they can merge also and do the same thing, or that gives them time to lobby to stop the merger. And that's more likely what is happening, that, they're, that they're, it gives them time to, to, to send money to Washington to, get, to buy off enough politicians to, uh, to get the Federal Trade Commission or the Antitrust Division to, to stop this because they know the end result of this will be uh, a more competitive company. You know, whenever two companies are merging, by the way, and you see antitrust litigation, one of the things you you know automatically is that the the people who are behind the litigation think that the merger will result in lower prices and or better products. Because if the merger would result in higher prices, all the rest of the companies would be better off. They could they could also charge the higher prices, or they can keep their price where it is and underprice the newly merged corporation and take market share away from them. It's only when they think the result of a merger will be lower prices and or better products that you see these other companies urging the government to uh, to sue them under the antitrust laws. I think there's or a sue them in private private court. I think there's a prejudice in general against mergers among the public because they they just think that big business is bad or dangerous when in fact what's going on is on the market, there's always an adjustment process, and that adjustment process includes firm size. It's quite possible for a firm to be unwieldy and too large and be involved in too many things, and some of those things are unprofitable, so it needs to slough off some of it and become smaller. Well, likewise, couldn't it just as equally be the c case that a, uh, a firm is too small? And it needs to be larger. For, for example, it could be that the initial outlay or the, the capital investment in some industry is so great that it can't support 15 firms making such huge capital investments. They'd all lose money. But if it gets reduced to six firms, they can all make a go of it. Right, that's exactly right. And, then, and of course, there's also, there's always potential competition from anywhere in the world. Right. You, know, if you really are making a ton of money as a monopoly. You're going to attract the Japanese and the Germans and the South Koreans and everybody from anywhere on the planet could come in and start uh, competing with you. And, and the capital markets are a lot more fluid now than they were 50, 60, 75 years ago during the heyday of antitrust. And so they'll, you know, they'll they'll allow the uh, the investment to occur to compete with you. And uh, yeah, it's called economies of scale. Companies need to be, need to be bigger. Uh, one of the advantages is the, the cost of production that tends to go down in a lot of industries. And also, you know, the main reason for why a, a company gets big is that people like its product. <laughs> if, if a lot of people like it, well, yeah, you're going to get big and successful. Um, you know, one of the, you know, years ago, you know, a, a good example of the, the absurdity of antitrust was when I, I lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and there was this little sort of a, uh, a unknown uh, grocery chain it had a weird name called Red Foods, which sounds kind of very strange, Red Foods. But they were very, very competitive. And, they, and their, their competitive model was they just did a better job than all the other grocery stores. And they, they had Food Lion in town and Kroger's and, you know, other big uh, grocery stores. But they just did a better job at, uh, at charging a very low price and making a low margin. Maybe they made a penny on every can of peas. But they sold more cans of peas than anybody else because it was it was cheaper, and as a result, they had a 60% market share in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and so they were pretty much automatically sued by the Federal Trade Commission uh, just on that statistic that they had a 60% market share. And so the the question always is, well, how did you get that market share? And the assumption by the government was there must be some sort of James Bondish conspiracy here between between Red Food and somebody else to have this market share. And, and they went through the whole system. They went through the litigation, and, the, and the, the government told them that they wanted to force them to sell seven of their stores. And and, uh, and it took like a couple of years for this all to shake, to shake out. And finally, a federal judge in Atlanta came down with the decision and I can still recall her, her what she said. It was a female judge. I can't remember her name. And she said, uh, said that basically that uh, the cause of the market share was they did a better job at charging low prices for food than anybody else. Case closed. They were, you know, found, you know, not guilty of violating the antitrust laws. And that happens hundreds of, has happened hundreds and hundreds of times in our history. That's why even, even left wingers like, uh, Lester Thoreau, who used to be the uh, 
dean of the uh, management school at MIT and, uh, and wrote quite a few books in the 80s and into the 90s. And is, is a very well-known liberal or left-wing economist. He actually called for the abolition of antitrust in the 1980s because he saw countries like Japan just uh, eating the lunch of American car companies and steel companies and so forth, and they didn't have antitrust over there. And they didn't have this problem. So he saw, even a guy like Thoreau saw antitrust as a major hindrance in American competitiveness on international markets and, and argued for the complete abolition, just like Dominic Armentano. I didn't know that. That's that's very yeah. interesting. All right, I'm going to let you go because I feel like you've given. Uh, we've already had too many listener heads explode from what we've said up to this point. So, <laughs> got got to keep the listenership going. But Tom, thanks for your time. If people are interested in this subject, of course they can read the books that we mentioned today. But of course, I want to direct them to your books, and on this topic in particular, we can direct them to How Capitalism Saved America, where they'll learn not only about this but about all kinds of suppressed and interesting history uh, from. Uh, from our, our past. So thanks so much for being here today. Uh, my pleasure, Tom. Uh, anytime. Thanks, Tom. Let me note very quickly that the most recent course we added at libertyclassroom.com has a couple of lessons specifically on this subject of competition and so-called perfect competition, the, the way the textbooks think of competition versus the way competition actually occurs in the real world. Uh, that's covered, uh, and it, the perfect competition model is decisively smashed over in that course. It's a course where we take the most popular Keynesian textbook that students are likely to encounter and go through chapter by chapter giving a, a withering Austrian critique. So check that out. That's course number 11 uh, available for download at libertyclassroom.com. You all know that the uh, promotion we're running right now is 50% off with coupon code AUSTRIAN in all caps. Also, remember, my new book is out. I promise you'll enjoy reading it. It covers all the issues you guys love. Plus, it's got my replies to a lot of the, I don't want to call them bad guys, but let's just say nasty people, because that's what they are. A lot of these people who have been attacking us uh, over the past few years are rather nasty, and I give, a, I think, a pretty solid libertarian response to them. So you can check that out at realdescent.com because the book is Real Descent. A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. Find out all about it at realdescent.com. And this time, I narrated the audiobook myself. People have been demanding that I do that, so I did it. And you can get it for free, the audiobook version, that is, at tomwoodsaudio.com. Thanks for listening once again, everybody. See you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.